Good afternoon. My name is Mohammed Sayyar. Uh, you know, in a, this presentation has two parts. First, I review some fundamental requirement associated with TAMP and TPM. Then, uh, I review some uh, slides about bridge, how it's applied to bridge management system, and then I will take care of the pavement side. Uh, you know, in a joint presentation, being the first presenter gives me advantage of. Uh, not being blamed if we run out of time. So <laughs> blame him. <laughs> yeah. So since last year, the TAMP requirement, TPM, uh, transportation performance management came out, there are a lot of challenges for DOTs, for local agencies to establish um, targets, performance targets. So the question is, what's the uh, char characteristics of effective targets, performance targets, and how you, you can set effective targets in order to get uh, highest return on investment. So in this presentation, we'll go over some basic requirements uh, associated with TPM, what is inside that, elements of that, uh, reporting requirements, then we'll follow with uh, bridge case study, and then Harry Field present the pavement side. So transportation performance management, TPM. Let's see what it is. That's the definition is a strategic approach that uses uh, system information to make policy and investment decisions in order to achieve the national performance goals. The national performance goals are already uh, defined in MAP21 and in order to make investment and policy decisions. We need to follow performance-based uh, planning and programming uh, framework defined in TPM. So there are six elements in that. Uh, as you see that it starts with national goals, so, uh, and it goes with measures, standard measure that is consistent uh, across the country, reporting requirements, and this framework actually increases the fund effectiveness and transparency toward how we spend public funds. Uh, also, it increases the um, uh, collaboration among all the stakeholders. So, as I said, that the performance-based um, planning and programming is part of the TPM to generate the planning investment plans. So it starts with goals and uh, objectives. That is the uh, strategic goal. So in general, uh, we need to answer four questions. Where to go, how to get there, what it takes to get there, and how did we do. So it starts with strategic direction, that is goals and objectives. MAP21 already defined the measures, standard measures for that. and. We go to target setting, uh, which is how we get to that point. Then resource allocation, that how much it takes to get to that point. And then eventually we monitor and evaluate that. So the most important part, and it's a hot, hot topic today, is the target setting. It's due in six months, and you need to report it to feds. So in order to do that, you need to identify the trends and uh, actually short-term targets and uh, compare different strategies and uh, different what-if scenarios. And the whole target setting, evaluation, and resource allocation should be aligned with the high-level goals. So what is the requirement? Uh, I mean, mandatory reporting requirements. Uh, the first thing is State DOTs should work with uh, local agencies to establish performance targets. And over a four-year performance period, they need to report those targets along with uh, a two-year, which is meet performance period, and full performance period, which is four-year progress report to the phase to show how they, they, are, they are doing toward achieving those targets. So for example, the, the first uh, report is due this October, and 
you need to report the baseline as of uh, 2018, January 1st, 2018, and the target two-year and four-year targets. For example, for bridge is uh, the condition to be achieved as of January 1st, 22, 2020, 2020 uh, in terms of percentage of bridges in good condition and percentage of bridges in poor condition as two year and the four year is same target, similar targets, but the, the target to be achieved as January 1st, 2020. So let's look at the key dates here. And you see that the first four year performance period already started this year. And it goes by the end of 2021. And starting 2022, the second four year performance period uh, will start. And in January 1st, 2018, January 1st, 2020, and 2022 will be used as a baseline that uh, you will, that feds will determine if you have significant progress toward achieving those targets, reported targets or not. Uh, so these are the baseline you see, and this is the report two days, that the first one is October this year. In the mid year, in the mid performance period report, you have a chance to update the targets is, uh, if needed. And the full performance period will be due on October 1st, 2022. Uh, just one thing I wanna mention here is, you see that the performance uh, planning and programming is based on four year period. So I saw that last week I was in bridge conference, preservation bridge conference, and I saw that many uh, states are doing, um, establishing targets or planning based on four year or five year period. So we'll see that in case study that if it's enough or we should go beyond that. So these are uh, general requirement that those are applicable to both bridge and pavement. Now, uh, I wanna show that how uh, specific requirements in bridge will fit into the framework, TPM framework. So first, let's start with performance measures for bridges. Uh, many of you may already be familiar with that, but I just review that very quickly. So in uh, TPM MAP21, Fast Act, they are all referring to NBI ratings. They don't care about element yet. So still, we measure the performance based on deck, superstructure, and substructure. If it's seven or above, it's classified as good. Five or six, classified as fair. And four or below, classified as poor. The overall bridge classification goes with the lowest or worst classification of those three components. So for example, if you have a bridge that let's say deck rating is six, considered as fair, uh, superstructure four, which is poor, uh, substructure seven, so the overall classification will be poor, which goes with the worst one. So regardless what you uh, set as a target, you need to maintain a minimum condition uh, as a specified map 21 and carry it over to fast, same thing. So the percentage of the, poor in the bridges, NHS bridges classified as poor cannot exceed 10%. So no matter what your target is, this is the mandatory and how it's calculated the total deck area of NHS bridges classified as poor divided by the total deck area of NHS bridges in a state. So if you cannot meet that for three consecutive years, then there will be some limitation to use NHPP funds. So those funds can go to only eligible uh, NHS uh, uh, projects. So another thing that Two things here. One is now starting January 1st this year, the definition of structure deficient is changed. So the, now it's less confusion that now it's poor and structural deficient are same. Um, 
and one more thing is, if you see here that uh, feds penalize states based on poor condition. So we'll see that uh, how it works. So the mentality, it, it, it may make that mentality that you need to uh, focus on poor structures. And we'll see that in case study what happens if we focus only on poor structures. So investment strategy and priorities, there are two uh, general strategies that we can take, reactive or proactive. So we know that proactive is better. For me, actually, uh, I graduated from Michigan State, so for me, it's always go green. So I go green proactive. So what for reactive is what is uh, called warfare, and it was practiced for many years. DOTs. Uh, and it says that priority goes to critical structures, and we know that it doesn't lead to uh, the highest return on investment. But proactive says that keep good bridges in, in a state of good repair, and take early action before minor problem becomes critical or even be created. So how it's uh, uh, related to treatment categories and bridges, we have uh, three general treatment categories, preservation or minor repairs or maintenance, rehabilitation, and replacement. Let's see how it's uh, related to performance index. So for example, the preservation is applied when bridge is still in good condition or it's just uh, between good and fair. So by doing preservation or minor repair, we can back the bridge up to good. It's low cost treatment. This is the rehabilitation that applies when bridge is uh, in fair or poor. Uh, it's more expensive. Uh, I think it's in average three or four times more expensive than uh, preservation and the replacement is the most expensive treatment that's too late to repair the bridge. Uh, so when you see that, when uh, FEDS put, or MAP21 put penalty on poor, uh, so it looks like that if you focus on that, we will have more replacement and expensive projects. And by the way, this, the replacement cost is something like 10 times more expensive than preservation. Uh, that's based on the study I did on, in Michigan and their projects. So this is a case study. I used uh, Georgia Network, 15,000 bridges. I, I included both NHS and non-NHS bridges. I defined first scenario as reactive scenario that I put only um, constraint on poor, 2%, and no target on good. The first one, the, the next one is uh, I added constraint or target on good at 60%, kept the same 2% for poor. Uh, I call this proactive, and the third scenario is more proactive. So it's 2% for poor and 62% for good. Uh, and in all of that, I'm trying to minimize the cost to achieve those targets. I use Agile, uh, Agile Asset Structure Analyst. This is a framework that we use the, the, the system uses the uh, condition data and uh, using the models, it uh, predicts the deterioration over time based on decision trees. It applies, it applies treatment uh, to each component, then the optimization solver uh, finds the optimized solution for that and generates project uh, based on that and calculates the projected uh, condition in future. So here is the condition of um, poor condition of the network um, before applying treatment in a year. So it means that, for example, if in a given year 
that uh, I have a target, for example, in 2023 that is above 2% that I put as a target for poor. So the system generates projects to reduce that to the target, to generate projects to reduce it to 2% uh, of uh, constraint. So the same thing uh, for good condition, and if you look at the 2021, that the system generates project to fill that gap and uh, improve the system, improve the network back to the target. As you see that in uh, scenario one, since I didn't define any target or any constraint for good, so there is no projects generated for that. So let's see that what the, what's the long term condition. Uh, the long term net for performance is for scenario one is 2% that in all scenarios actually we define 2% as poor. Uh, and in scenario one, since we didn't define any constraint for good, we have 90%, 91% of our network in fair. So we lost a lot of good bridges after 10 years and they are in uh, fair. But in scenario two and scenario three, we already defined uh, targets for good and fair, uh, good and actually for good and poor. So, and when you look at this, you see that the scenario three has the highest good. Uh, so it actually is the best condition. Uh, it's the best, it's the scenario that gives us the best condition. So let's see how, how much it costs us over time. So this is the, actually the treatment cost over 10 years. And uh, in early stage, the cost of scenario one is none almost. Uh, but after a while, it goes up. Uh, so this is the total cost that uh, in scenario one, we have something around $6 billion. And scenario two and three, we have $4 billion. Um, so let's see how co cumulative cost is over time. If you remember that I mentioned that in a four-year performance period, um, several states at least I saw that they are doing planning based on four-year or five-year. So if you look at the cumulative cost over first five years, you see that the scenario one has the lowest cost, and scenario two and three uh, have higher than scenario one. Actually, the most expensive scenario is scenario three. But when we look at this in 10-year cumulative cost, you see the least expensive scenario is scenario three. So even though we got better uh, network condition, it has the lowest cost. And the scenario one, which was the reactive scenario, or worst first scenario, has uh, the highest cost. So someone may argue that these costs are applied at different times. So here is the present value of those costs. So still, by, compar by comparing scenario one and scenario two, see that uh, around 32% uh, um, scenario one is more expensive than scenario two. But we knew that the uh, worst first scenario or worst first strategy is not very uh, effective. So, but I wanna uh, emphasize on scenario two and three that they both have target on poor and good, but the, the target on good in scenario three was higher than scenario two, but still you see that by focusing more on good or increasing uh, the target on good, we get the lower um, cost in scenario three. Uh, so actually by looking at the distribution of treatments, we can see that the, in scenario three, we have the highest number of preservation works. And in scenario one, actually we have the least number of them and in replacement cost, 
uh, replacement treatment scenario one has the highest number of the treatment compared to almost doubled as scenario two and three. So by doing early stage treatment, we can get a better uh, long-term condition and actually we can use the performance measures as constraint or even as objective in our system to uh, do a long-term uh, what-if scenario. Um, even though TPM wants the five-year or short-term planning, but we need to go beyond that. So asset management is not an overnight or short-term practice. You need to go uh, long enough to see specifically preservation benefits can be realized over long term. And, but uh, the distribution of funds in my model was not very uniform. So actually this, is a, this study was just to show the benefits of preservation and very extreme scenarios. So you need to have uh, more constraint on that to have a uniform budget. And the last but not least, the focusing on good targets can lead to more uh, preservation treatments and a better long-term condition. Now let's bridge the bridge yes, paper. <coughs> Thank you. All right, thank you uh, very, uh, very much, uh, Mohammed, for laying out all the background about uh, TPM, uh, MAP21, uh, and all the deadlines. So I will not be talking about any of that. Uh, jumping directly uh, on the pavement uh, part of the uh, presentation, uh, very important in part of the infrastructure. Uh, MAP21 is a huge program and obviously a big focus on the uh, management and tracking of pavements. So we will talk about uh, national performance measures for pavement. Uh, and uh, as a case study or, uh, you know, I used the state of Alaska data. I'm working with them right now. We are implementing PMS. Uh, we are not live yet, uh, still working. Uh, uh, but we had uh, some very good uh, 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 what I would say, uh, collecting exactly the same data which uh, uh, MAP21 requires. So that was the best uh, data to use. Uh, Andrew is here, uh, so he's from Alaska and I think he will see some good things today. So a uh, couple of things about uh, uh, data collection for pavement. Uh, it is applicable on the full NHS network uh, interstate or uh, non-interstate uh, NHS, and uh, only the main lanes. Uh, uh, at this point, uh, definitely exclude excluding ramps, shoulders, and uh, uh, any of these excessive uh, pavement area. The condition data collection, uh, there are three parameters or three metrics. IRI, International Roughness Index, uh, we all know about that, inches per mile, uh, a um, measure of the uh, pavement uh, serviceability or uh, comfort. Uh, cracking, percent cracking is the second uh, uh, variable. And uh, rutting and uh, for asphalt and faulting for uh, concrete pavements. And the data is collected in one direction. Uh, another, uh, just uh, that there is some leeway that if you don't have data on about 5% or so, for different reasons, you know, there's some construction project going on or data is not good, uh, uh, you can exclude that as a limit uh, for that. Just like a bridge, a very similar approach uh, that, uh, that, that you have to two levels, good and poor, uh, in the percent of uh, pavement area, uh, how much it is in poor and good, will be a way to uh, specify uh, uh, here. So uh, now condition data uh, components are, uh, uh, and again, HPMS, uh, uh, which is data collect collection or the 0.1 mile, that is the basic source of 
of the data for, uh, for that. IRI, cracking, uh, rutting, and faulting, as just covered before. And for, in terms of effective date, interstate uh, system implementation is already uh, uh, January, January 1, it's uh, active. These are some, another two years uh, for non-interstate NHS, but uh, I believe some may be starting uh, the whole network already. These are the condition metrics or the thresholds for these individual condition metrics. For IRI, uh, it's less than 95 is considered good. Uh, between 95 to 170, fair. Greater than 170 is uh, poor. Cracking uh, less than 5% uh, is good. Then it varies based on asphalt or, or concrete. Uh, just looking at the poor, greater than 20% is the, is the poor cracking uh, and the asphalt, which are uh, in Alaska, honestly, it's all asphalt pretty much. Uh, but for 10 for CRCP and 15 for JCP. Rutting uh, poor is 0.4 and faulting poor is 0.15. So these are individual components which uh, uh, together define overall pavement condition measure. And this slide will show how uh, this overall pavement measure is uh, calculated. A uh, very simple approach, uh, you know, uh, we have three parameters for asphalt. If all three of them are good, it's good. So the overall rating will be good. If uh, two or three, uh, two out of three are poor, uh, the section will be rated as, uh, as poor. All other combinations are fair. Uh, PCC, the only difference is that PCC have two uh, attributes, IRI and faulting. So if all two are good, it is good. All two are uh, uh, poor, it is poor. Uh, anything else is uh, fair. So this is how uh, once we have this individual distress data collected, we can calculate this overall rating based on this uh, rule. Just a quick, uh, uh, you know, a very obvious uh, uh, example here. If we have three parameters, IRI was uh, poor, it was more than, uh, it is a 180, more than 170. Uh, cracking is 7%, rutting is 0.3, both are fair. So overall rating for this piece of road will be fair. And uh, this is the minimum threshold which uh, MAP21 have put forward uh, that no more than 5% of your uh, NHS pavement network cannot be uh, uh, in the poor state. So that's the minimum goal they have uh, uh, specified. That does not mean that that's the only thing you have to manage, but, but that's a bare minimum which every state have to now take into account. There's a penalty also, uh, and the penalty is that if uh, the states fail to report uh, that level of uh, conformity, uh, they may have to raise some funds themselves or divert some funds from their own uh, you know, state programs into the NHS uh, program. So these are stick as well uh, if they fail to do that. From a pavement perspective, uh, there are so many ways. Uh, uh, it's all about you have a pavement network and different conditions. Uh, you always have different conflicting objectives. You want to minimize uh, your uh, budget and you want to get uh, maximum condition for, from the available budgets. At the same time, uh, you want to know that, oh, if I want to meet certain minimum uh, conditions, what budget I will need. So from our perspective, uh, 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 we can run uh, several or multiple uh, uh, what if uh, scenarios uh, with setting these different uh, targets as constraints and objectives and then uh, look at our results and make some uh, conclusions from that. So, so here, uh, uh, so this just shows you that, you know, we can have different combination of, uh, uh, of uh, objective and constraints. Uh, pavement analyst uh, has a very powerful analysis module. Uh, the one, several of you uh, are the regular users of that. And, uh, 
uh, with the optimization engine, uh, the choices are unlimited how much you can model. So when I was setting up uh, these scenarios, uh, so uh, I set up uh, initially three scenarios, uh, very similar to like Mohammed uh, uh, shared here, for a period of 10 years, uh, just to, network is about 2100 center line miles uh, there. So I set a very base scenario that, oh, I want to, uh, what is the minimum cost that I rake up, uh, maintain 5% for all my 10 years? That was my base scenario. Uh, in the scenario two, uh, I started putting some targets. So I say, okay, 5% is my minimum, uh, but I also want 20% of my uh, pavement to be in good condition. So at uh, no year, they should drop 20% uh, uh, from the good. Uh, anything in between is fair, obviously. Uh, for scenario three, I uh, just raised it a little more to 28%. Uh, and uh, uh, so I, I ran those three scenarios and I'll be showing you results anyway. Uh, then I noticed that uh, obviously, you know, when you are running this type of scenario, uh, budgets are fluctuating every year. You are getting some peaks, some, it is just trying to fix a lot of things in year one, then have nothing to do for a couple of years, jumping up and back and forth. That is good for analysis and all that. Realistically, you always have some fixed typical budgets every year. Uh, and there may be some leeway for sure, but still it's like, oh, I have 100 million each year and that's the best I have and I want to maximize my returns on that. So I created two more scenarios here uh, from that perspective. Uh, I pretty much used uh, what was the total cost coming from scenario two, uh, which was about uh, an average of 100 million a year. So I used that as a, as a budget constraint that, okay, this is my budget constraint. Uh, I cannot spend more than 100 million uh, each year. Uh, but I want to, uh, I still want to control my 5% as well, uh, but, but I want to now maximize my IRI. Uh, and similarly, uh, in the last scenario, I, I put 75 million uh, with the goal uh, uh, to maximize my IRI, but still maintaining 5% threshold as well. So with these uh, uh, scenarios, uh, just a very quick uh, schematic and uh, I won't be going into detail at all, but just want to emphasize the, the how important is the quality of your inputs, your unit cost, your treatments, your uh, decision tree, your models. I mean, they should be, you should have a lot of confidence uh, because they are all feeding, it is uh, the, all the calculations are based on all of them. So the quality of data is very important as well to, to really have uh, reliable uh, results you can trust them and uh, uh, use them for your policy decisions, just to emphasize that. Uh, this is just a quick list of treatments. Uh, uh, in Alaska, it's a lot about uh, mill and fill of multiple levels, uh, crack seal obviously, so there's a typical, you know, some preservation, uh, some uh, minor rehab, uh, and then uh, some reconstruction as well, but they do a lot of uh, uh, milling and uh, uh, and uh, basically overlay after that. Okay, now some of the, the, the numbers now. Uh, so from performance perspective, uh, uh, this is just showing uh, for, for these five scenarios. And uh, that 5% obviously it is maintained uh, uh, for all the, the first three scenarios because that was the, the goal. So we have a pretty much like a straight line for them. Uh, but for the scenarios where uh, uh, money, uh, that was not a, a constraint, we, we, you can see that uh, we can even go lower than 5% as well. Because that is not, uh, because when you are running that con constraint exclusively, all it does, it fixed to 5% and stops. Uh, but, but that is uh, good to have that minimum target, but, but we want to do uh, overall, uh, you know, uh, uh, asset management here. Similarly, uh, the similar uh, calculation for uh, good. Uh, you can see where we have our 20% uh, threshold. It's maintaining steady uh, and then 28%. Uh, but where we have uh, uh, these, these uh, budgets are very, uh, the, the budgets are very, uh, are so, so here uh, it's going uh, based on uh, uh, how much it can find 
the projects to, to fix and the reporting here. Now these are the, the budget levels as I was uh, uh, sharing with you before. Uh, this is this 100 million scenario here, every year 75 million. And uh, this is uh, the, the lowest one where we are only uh, trying to uh, do uh, the lowest, uh, uh, fixing the poor at, at the 5%. So, so that's the lowest uh, cost here. They, they still, that's the one difference which we find, what Mohammed find and I find, uh, simply uh, uh, because bridges are probably their replacement cost is so huge. So they suddenly they, they go at a, at a point that they skyrocket and they overtake uh, all the cost and become maybe a more efficient for like multi-year. Multi uh, in my case for pavement, honestly, uh, if I keep fit fixing a uh, poor, uh, it's not really, uh, 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 it's not like the, everything is falling apart. It's not, there's still a whole bunch of fear there and, uh, uh, and, and also maybe my unit costs for reconstruction are not that big. So it is not really uh, uh, eating a lot of money from there. So these are the cumulative uh, budgets for these uh, five scenarios. Uh, and you can see uh, this is the, the lowest one. Uh, we're only uh, fixing for 5% poor. Uh, for the other two, because I, uh, I come up with 100, and 100 million and 75 million based on uh, what I get from the first uh, scenario two and three. So obviously uh, cumulative uh, values are, are very similar. So, so that's the idea that we have these scenarios, we can look at what type of performance we are getting, say, uh, between uh, uh, two and three to, and, uh, and these two, because the money is very similar. So, so how they are more or less we are getting in terms of uh, performance. Here we have uh, the distribution of uh, fair, good, and poor. Uh, the very first bar is the current condition. So we are sitting at uh, about 6% poor, you know, some 22% uh, and 72% uh, fair. Uh, and scenario zero, I also added, like if you do do nothing, like nothing is happening for 10 years, obviously there's a big 25% uh, uh, of your payment will become poor and nothing good and there's a, a good amount of fear. And, but maybe uh, several of these fear will be at the higher side of the, uh, IRI and so forth. This is an average, so it's still pretty bad. And uh, so, so whenever uh, we are running scenario, uh, the first two where our constraints are 5% here, uh, it is uh, doing that, uh, plus uh, uh, we are maintaining 20% uh, and 75% uh, fear. Where we are, uh, we have uh, our 28% uh, uh, and 71, 1.2. So we even have scenarios where we are exceeding, uh, you know, uh, uh, that 5% uh, where we have given system to be flexible and, uh, and, and find a project based on uh, the IRI area under the curve performance model. Uh, it was able to give you even little more. This is uh, the, the same, uh, uh, basically just this is the average value. And the previous one was uh, at the end of uh, 10 years, what the uh, network value uh, will be. Also, you know, uh, uh, for pavement people, IRI is, is, is a big deal. So, so simply I'm showing you here how IRI is changing uh, for all of these scenarios. Uh, uh, available if, because that can be set as one of your major criteria when you are setting these targets as well. So, so this scenario where we have 100 million uh, uh, allocated, we are getting uh, the lowest IRI. Uh, so if that is a higher priority uh, for policy item, that may dictate uh, to establish uh, our targets. This is uh, the distribution of uh, money by uh, budget categories like preventative maintenance, uh, 
rehabilitated, like a one hour, which are more like a thin overlay or the mill and fill, like a smaller rehabs, and then uh, uh, replace and, and, and reconstruct. So, so there's a steady uh, amount of, uh, uh, you know, replacement projects, uh, pretty steady amount of uh, uh, preservation, uh, a big chunk because their decision tree is so heavily into, uh, into mill and fill, so that's the big chunk. So that is the, uh, with nothing wrong with that, simply I was looking at text dot presentation, their mill and fill and thin overlays are actually pre preventative maintenance. So effectively, they are pre preventative treatments uh, simply, uh, I've grouped them here as, as 1R, so they are showing up uh, here, uh, but they are big, big time preservation treatments as well. So, so, so basically, uh, moving forward, so, so what, what you can do is basically uh, our system, it can definitely uh, help you uh, to establish uh, these pavement performance targets. Uh, what approach should be that design multiple network analysis scenarios, set up uh, appropriate objective and constraints, uh, compare scenario results, establish uh, these targets based on performance measures or individual condition matrices like IRI and, and cracking as well. Uh, the main thing is that don't get focused too much on the minimum condition, that is just a minimum condition you have to go above and beyond and continue uh, practicing uh, good network pavement asset management. Uh, but since you have to report to the, uh, to the Fed that what is your goal for good, uh, it's very important to find out what you can claim. I will deliver 25% good every year for next four years and so forth. Uh, so pretty much uh, uh, what Muhammad uh, concluded uh, that uh, performance measures can be modeled as constraint to determine cost to achieve those targets. And uh, comparison of uh, those scenarios can help you uh, to make uh, informed decision about uh, establishing those targets. And, uh, and honestly, uh, there can be so many other variation of scenarios which we may can run. Uh, so they can be, you can do more than that. The, these five are just, uh, you know, uh, some representative uh, uh, collection, I would say. There could be so many other ways uh, to, to look at impact of different funding streams and uh, some other constraints. With that, uh, uh, that's the end of the presentation. And uh, any questions from Mohammed or myself? Yes, yeah. we did. Yeah, we have Mike. Okay. Mike, uh, Patrick, and yeah, Patrick. Sorry. Yes, girls. For you, Arif. Um, so one of the interesting things uh, that we've kind of found is, uh, especially on the pavement side, obviously, is you know when you're looking at that percent poor you're really looking at it at the management section level, right? Yes, yes. And so yeah, I did that, not mention that. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, that's actually pretty conservative because, you know, because let's say we're talking asphalt, you know, two of those three measures have got to be poor at the 10th mile level. And so for them to be, you know, the same as what you're predicting, they have to literally overlap. You know, it has to be poor in the same 10th mile for both, let's say, IRI and cracking. So I just was wondering if you had looked at that at all. Yeah, I think uh, if I just expand on this. So, so practically, which is not, not a, so do we run analysis for 0.1 mile segments? Theoretically, it's possible, but it's not the common practice, neither common sense. So we have this challenge that we are assuming that, that this 0.1 mile uh, you know, uh, data collected, we are doing some averages, average, and then saying, oh, this is what it is. So. I don't know if they will approve it or not, Fed, based on that, but <laughs> maybe that's what we can do. I think there's a question, uh, Vina. I noticed that you had that 5% threshold on both interstate and non-interstate NHS. Yes. And I'm 
think it is not applicable to non-interstate NHS. Uh, actually, uh, the date is different. Uh, uh, so from 2018, interstate is already mandated that they have to, you have to provide uh, targets for interstate only. But from 2020 January, it will be for both. So no. if well, yeah, you have to, I'm not talking about setting the targets. I'm talking about that 5% threshold well, is only applicable to interstate NHS, not non-interstate NHS, way back in the beginning. Yeah, yeah, I think I know exactly. Uh, I think that's what I, uh, I read a couple of, uh, uh, so maybe uh, uh, there's a, the only number five percent I, I saw. So, uh, but you know, uh, we can look at mm -hmm. that. If it is any higher number, you know, they may allow a little more. Maybe the only thing I read somewhere was that Alaska is allowed ten percent poor for some reason. There was a, a, a strict. <laughs> so. Uh, uh, this one's for Mohammed. Okay. Um, hey. Uh, with, I completely agree with you that uh, proactive maintenance is much better than reactive mm -hmm. maintenance. However, a lot of agencies are have corner are in a corner position where we where they have some critical infrastructure that are already failing, which they can't close down, and they have to spend the money on that, and they have whatever limited budget that they have. Any thoughts on that? I mean, um, I think there are only three states that are struggling with that threshold, 10% threshold. Uh, yeah, and one of them is Michigan. So I'm, I, I live in Michigan, unfortunately, yeah. So yeah, th there are three of them, and they already requested to extend that uh, penalty or the time, because that, that penalty applies starting this year. But uh, Fed said that you already knew that, so you had to plan for it, so they didn't accept that. Uh, but yeah, I agree with you, some states are struggling with that. But the good thing is, FEDs do not uh, reduce or uh, put limitation on the amount of funds, it just uh, allocate the funds just to NHS projects. So that's, uh, but I agree with you, yeah, there are some states at least three of them uh, cannot meet that 10%. Uh, I think and, uh, the other, the worst one is Pennsylvania. Anyone from Pennsylvania here? Oh, sorry. <laughs> we're, yeah. we're not in the first four years, but after the first four years, the bridges are over. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I guess uh, Mohamed also the, the bridge analysts can take into account of like specific bridges, or we can designate those bridges. You can have a different target for Yes, yeah. yes. Actually, you can just select subset of data and have different strategy for them. And we actually recommend that when we talk specifically for, with specific uh, states, we recommend that, for example, for very important bridges, they should be excluded from network level uh, planning and programming because they have their own budgets or their own issues. Uh, they cannot be closed or uh, they, they need to have special attention. Yeah. Anybody? Delaware going once? <laughs> <laughs> Quebec? You're good? Right. Anybody else? Okay, well, I guess it's dinner time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.